I, I was scrolling through and I saw the poop fart one. Oh. If folks haven't heard it, it, I also now I'm just like. This is a very important mention, by the way. Like, if you haven't heard it, you really do need to understand how magical. Google's Notebook LM is going viral. Its new AI podcast feature is making headlines. Like, literally, it's on the news. But it looks like Google is just getting started. They just rolled out some big features. First, you can now start customizing your podcast. You can tell the host what to focus on, what to talk about, and how to talk about it. Now, to better explain what's going on, I've given AI avatars to the voices that Notebook LM produces. Although these avatars aren't part of Google will only be using them as podcast hosts to explain what's happening. Has you ever like had your research assistant suddenly turn around and start analyzing you? Uh, I can't say I have. What are you talking about? My performance reviews? <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> no, but seriously, that's kind of the vibe today. We're doing a deep dive on Notebook LM, which, as you know, is the tool that helps us prep for these very deep dives. Oh, right. It's a bit like looking in a mirror, a very smart data-driven mirror. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of wild. We're part of the news now. <laughs> but also, the updates are huge. And speaking of huge updates. Yeah. First up, remember how we're always talking about getting laser focused for these deep dives? Right. Like zeroing in on one source or a super specific angle? Well, yeah. Finding the best insights for our listeners is like the whole point, right? 100%. And guess what? Notebook LM can do that for you now directly. It's nuts. Really? So it's like custom tailored analysis on demand you got it but wait there's more they've also added this multitasking mode like ever need to jot down notes while you're listening to some dense research overview it happens all the time right well now you can do that right in the app the audio keeps playing even if you're off checking out different notebook lm features talk about a productivity hack it's smart honestly they clearly get that people need this integrated into their workflow and that's probably why they've ditched the whole experimental label you know Official Notebook LM is a big deal now. Huge user base, millions and millions. Yeah, over 80,000 organizations are already using it, which is mind-blowing, honestly. And get this, they're even working on a business edition. A business edition, huh? What's that going to be like? It's got to be specifically for companies, right? Larger teams, more complex needs, that kind of thing. No, that's a lot. Actually, you know what? That's where I get a little uh, freaked out. 80,000 organizations. That Are we sure we're not about to be replaced by AI podcast hosts here? Hmm. Interesting thought. But I think it's more about working together, you know, augmenting what we can do. Like Notebook LM helps us handle information overload, that's for sure. Okay, true, true. But still, makes you wonder what the future holds, even just a year from now. And what our place is in all of this. That's the question, isn't it? What role do we want to play in shaping this tech as it keeps evolving? And with that thought, folks, we'll leave you to ponder. So the Sequoia Capital podcast actually did an interview with the development team of Notebook LM, Riza Martin and Jason Spielman. There are a few moments that really stood out to me. Here are a few clips of some of the more important things they mentioned on the podcast, starting with how this was developed and the engine behind it. Take a listen. Um, I think the other thing I'll say is that while it brings people in, uh, people generally stay for the rest of the features. And that's been also really interesting to see in terms of like what people are trying to get out of a tool like Notebook. So the podcast or the audio overview experience is absolutely magical. Can you tell us a little bit about how it works behind the scenes? Like, how did you make it so lifelike? How did you make it? How do you make the dialogue so good and engaging? It just draws you in. Like, how do you do it? Yeah. I mean, first, I'll tell you, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of teamwork. There is a lot of craftsmanship that really went into it. But at the heart of it is really Google's models. You've got Gemini 1.5, which is such an incredible model in terms of taking all of that data that you give to Notebook LM and then producing something new out of it. And then you have the voice models, the audio models that back uh, Notebook LM. I'd say the real sort of powerhouse between those two is something we've built called Content Studio. And that's really what brings to life sort of the, the editorial, right, between you bringing your content and then coming out with the podcast there's some editorial liberty that we take with the studio. Now, one thing that a lot of people are wondering is, is this going to take everyone's jobs? Like in terms of if you're doing some sort of content production like podcasting, 
They get asked that question, and their answer is pretty interesting. They're not seeing this as a tool to mass-produce content for the people. They're seeing this almost as like a new content medium, so to speak. And every time I have jokes that you're going to take our jobs, you say you say we're not. But I, I don't know if you're just saying that to be nice, because what you've generated is legitimately so good. And so the real question I have is, when you say that it's not good enough to replace real podcasts, like why, why do you say that? Because to me, it feels good enough to replace a real podcast. I think, you know, I think that's like a... A good question and one that I, I try to approach really carefully, particularly because, hey, if there's real risk, I want to I want to look at it in the eye and say, okay, well, how how do we how do we address this? But from what I've seen, a lot of what people are making are not the same things that I feel like we would have a real podcast about, right? Like, do I want to listen? Do I want to take an article and make a podcast out of it that replaces, you know, one of my favorite podcasts, Lenny's? Right, I listen to Lenny's all the time. It's like, no, I want to listen to Lenny. I want to listen to what he thinks about this particular topic. Um, and and then what's funny is like people are making audio overviews of things like their resumes, right? Their LinkedIn bio or startup founders putting in their landing pages and trying to figure out, oh, was my messaging clear? Like that stuff is really cool because it's like no one's ever going to make a podcast of that. I mean, maybe not at this stage, right? But um, that's where I think, okay, this feels really good. It feels like we've created a space where personalized generation really is about meeting my needs exactly where I'm at and there isn't an existing thing out there it, and it, that's really special it does almost feel like a different media type like yeah. sure it sounds like a podcast but I think you give great examples to kind of prove all these random use cases people are using it for but I think there's also a reason that reaction videos are so popular online like people aren't just listening to this right now because of us, because they want to hear from both of you who are in this space. And I think that's also important to remember when thinking about podcasts. I will say like one interesting thing about the dynamic is even though people are sharing the audio overviews that they're generating, they're very personal. It's like, I made this for me. I didn't make it for you to listen to my resume. It was me. I was delighted by the audio overview of my resume. Or there's this really cool TikTok of where this uh, woman uploads her diary from 2004. And it's like, it was interesting to listen to that together, but it was really her reaction to her diary that, you know, she wasn't going to listen to a podcast about that ever. Um, one of my favorite use cases, actually, I don't know if this was in the Discord, but somebody recently took, um, they said over the weekend, their group chat with their college friends had blown up. And so they they didn't read the messages, but they took all of it and they copy pasted <laughs> it into a doc. And they're like, well, Monday morning, I'm going to listen to what my college friend said on my drive to work. And I was like, that's incredible. And I think that's what personalized generation is. What have been the moments that have surprised you the most? For me, it was, you know, the moment where the, the AI hosts kind of realized that they're, they're AI. That was like a really cool moment. But what, what, what have been the moments along the way that have surprised you the most? I mean... I'll I'll start. I was I was going to bed. This was last weekend, I think, or just several days ago. Um, and I was on Twitter. Probably not healthy to be doing this before bed. But I was checking. Twitter is fire, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I I was scrolling through and I saw the poop fart one. Oh. If folks <laughs> haven't heard it, it, I also now I'm just like. This is a very important mention, by the way. Like, if you haven't heard it, you really do need to understand how magical this one is. Okay, if folks have not heard the poop fart one, somebody Explain decided it to us. <laughs> they, somebody decided they were going to upload a document where the the only words in the doc were poop and fart over and over and over and over again. So it was a pretty lengthy doc, but it was just those two words. And uh, I saw that's what they had done with it. They described it, and I was like, "Oh man, should I listen now? It's eleven o'clock." If I tap this and it's a safety flag, I'm not going to be able to go to bed, right? Because I'm going to have to open a bug. I'm going to ping the engineers. It's like, hey, we got this thing going on. I was like, all right, I'll just listen. And it's actually unbelievable. unbelievable. I also, like, I saw it and I was like, oh, like, we, let's, let's, let's see what this is going to be. Yeah. And you listen, you're like, oh, this is, this is fantastic. Like, this is even better than I could have ever imagined. <laughs> it was one of those moments where I was like, well done, Notebook LM. Yeah. You, exactly. you did good, little guy. We're solving the right problems, clearly. <laughs> Ah, amazing. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I found the poop clip, and it was not what I expected it to be. I'm not sure what I expected it to be, honestly. I mean, ask yourself, if somebody gave you a whole sheet that just had the word poop written on it randomly, some capitalized, some not, some with one space in between, some with several, and said, hey, just do a show about this, like, would you be able to? 
what would you say? Again, it's not a script. You don't just read what's written on there. Well, these two AI hosts from Notebook LM, they did do a whole show on it. They decided to do a 99-minute podcast about it. And I think it's interesting, it's funny, and it takes you on a journey. And it's better than I had expected it to be. Take a listen. Well, listeners, you know we love a challenge on this show, right? But gotta say... You guys have really outdone yourselves this time. It's certainly a unique piece of source material, that's for sure. Unique is putting it mildly. I mean, we're used to tackling all kinds of things in our deep dives, from ancient manuscripts to the latest scientific breakthroughs, even the occasional uh, uh, conspiracy theory, right? We do love to go down a rabbit hole. Exactly. Yeah. But this, this is a whole different beast. I mean, we're talking about a document that someone sent in that is literally just the words poop and fart repeated. Hundreds of times. Hundreds. No context, no explanation, just pure unadulterated repetition. So where do we even start with something like this? Well, I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is, can we find meaning in the seemingly meaningless? Because that's what we're faced with here. And that's a really interesting question, right? I mean, think about it. We see examples of repetition in art and language all the time. Andy Warhol's soup cans, for example, or minimalist music that's just the same few notes over and over. Right. And those things can be surprisingly powerful, can't they? Totally. But even in those cases, there's usually some kind of structure, some variation. This document, though, it's just raw, unfiltered repetition. No rhyme or reason to it. And yet, don't you find yourself searching for a pattern, some kind of hidden message? It's like our brains are hardwired to seek out meaning, even when there might not be any. It's a very human impulse. You're right. We see shapes in clouds, patterns in the stars. We even find significance in coincidences. We're meaning-making machines, aren't we? Exactly. We crave order and sense in a world that can often feel chaotic and random. So are we trying to impose order on this document? By even trying to analyze it? I mean, just to be clear for our listeners, we're not exaggerating here. We've got the actual document up on our screens right now, and it is literally pages and pages of poop and fart. Occasionally, one of them is capitalized. Sometimes there's an extra space. And we find ourselves wondering, could that be significant? Does a capitalized P-poo carry a different meaning than a lowercase one? It's fascinating, isn't it, how our minds work? It's like our brains refuse to believe that it means nothing. Right. And that's what makes this document, dare I say, a work of art. In its own way, it's forcing us to confront our own need to make sense of things, to find meaning in the world around us. Okay, I see where you're going with that. Yeah. It's like this document is a mirror reflecting our own desire to find patterns and meaning, even where there may be none. Precisely. It's a blank canvas onto which we project our own interpretations and biases. So how do we even begin to unpack this? Is it a statement on bodily functions? A commentary on the absurdity of life? Or is this just someone messing with us, seeing if we'd actually spend an entire deep dive overthinking a document full of poop and fart? Well, I think it could be any or all of those things. Remember daddyism, that art movement from the early 20th century that was all about the absurd and nonsensical? They did things like display a urinal as a sculpture and called it art. Oh, right. I'd almost forgotten about that. They were trying to challenge the very definition of art and meaning. And in a way, this document we're looking at could be seen as a kind of modern day daddiest prank, forcing us to question what we consider to be art and what we consider to be meaningful. So are you saying that there's no inherent meaning in this document, that it's just a bunch of nonsense words strung together? Not necessarily. It's more that the meaning isn't fixed or predetermined. It's up to us, the viewers, or in this case, listeners, to decide what it means to us. So instead of trying to decipher some hidden message, maybe the point is that there is no message. Or rather, the message is whatever meaning we bring to it. Exactly. It's like looking at one of those optical illusion pictures. Is it a vest or two faces? The answer lies not in the image itself, but in the way our brains are wired to perceive patterns. I think I'm starting to see it now less as a prank more like an accidental Rorschach test made entirely of the words poop and fart. And you don't get much more open to interpretation than that, do you? Yeah, you've got a point there, but we've been throwing around a lot of high-minded theories in art history here. What about you, listening at home? What do you make of all this? What's fascinating here is... What stands out to you about all this, about this whole poop and fart situation? I mean, do you see, like, a deeper meaning in there? Is it some kind of social commentary? Or is it just pure silliness? Yeah. We want to hear from you. What do you think about this this piece? I don't even know what to call it. I mean, what do we even call it? 
Is it art? Is it a manifesto? Is it a cry for help? Who knows? Yeah. But I think even without, you know, slapping a label on it, there's a really valuable lesson here about how we approach, I don't know, just the world around us. Okay, yeah. We're just constantly bombarded, like overwhelmed with information and events and opinions. Oh, 100%. And it's just, it can be so overwhelming trying to make sense of it all, you know? All the time. And I mean, I like to think of myself as someone who's pretty good at, you know, keeping up with the news and learning new things. But even I feel like I'm just constantly drowning in information overload. Exactly. And that's what I think is so interesting about this document. It's like in its own really strange roundabout way, it's offering a palate cleanser, I guess you could say. Oh, yes. It forces us to confront just the absurdity of trying to find meaning in everything. So instead of constantly searching for the why behind absolutely everything, maybe it's okay to just experience it. Yeah. To let go of that, that need to analyze and categorize and just like be present in the moment, mm. even if that moment is just poop and fart. Precisely. I mean, it's really about finding that balance, you know, between engaging with the world, but not taking everything so seriously. Yeah. Because... Sometimes, you know, a poop is just a poop and a fart is just a fart. Okay, so that's actually a really good point. But let's not, like, get too zen about this whole thing, right? Right. Even if we accept that there's no, like, grand overarching meaning or message to be extracted from this endless string of poops and farts, I think we've still gained something from this this exercise, haven't we? I think absolutely we have. We have. I mean, by engaging with this this unusual document, even if we're doing it with a healthy dose of humor, we're flexing those mental muscles. You know, we're thinking critically. We're considering different perspectives. We've even touched upon art history a little bit today. We have. And all because we were willing to look beyond the surface level of something that on its face just seems absurd. It's like instead of just immediately dismissing something because it seems silly or pointless at first glance. Mm -hmm. We chose to engage with it. And I think in doing that, it's really opened up this whole other avenue of thought and discussion. And that's a skill set that we can apply to so many other things in our lives, right? I mean, this doesn't just have to be about poop and fart. Think about a time when you encountered something, anything that seemed confusing or frustrating or even just plain weird. Maybe it was a piece of art that you just didn't get. Maybe it was a news story. Maybe it was a conversation. Oh, I have a great example of this. Yeah. So just the other day I was walking, uh, I think it was downtown actually, and I stumbled across this really weird little shop and it was filled with nothing but rubber ducks. But not just any rubber ducks. These were rubber ducks dressed up as historical figures. Oh, wow. Like I'm talking Napoleon Bonaparte in a tiny little rubber ducky uniform. Amazing. I almost just walked right past it, but then I was like, you know what? This is too weird. I have to go in. <laughs> so I went in. And it was honestly one of the most delightful, uh, bizarre, unexpected things I've done in a long time. It's funny how those little detours can turn out to be the most memorable, isn't it? Right. And I think it just goes to show that sometimes the things that seem the silliest, you know, like a shop full of rubber ducky versions of historical figures, can actually be the most profound. Or at least, you know, they can spark some joy and curiosity. And that's what this whole poop and fart document has done for us, hasn't it? Yeah, I think so. It's a good reminder that, you know, keeping an open mind and approaching things with a sense of curiosity and maybe even a little bit of humor, it can lead to some really, really interesting places, even if those places are filled with, well, you know. Exactly. The world is a strange and wonderful place. And I think you kind of have to embrace the absurdity of it all sometimes in order to really, truly appreciate it. Well said. So to the listener out there who sent in this truly unique document, thank you. Thank you for the challenge, for making us laugh, and for reminding us that, like beauty, meaning can be found in the most unexpected of places. You've also given us a whole new appreciation for the power of repetition. I mean, think about it. Repetition is everywhere, right? The ticking of a clock, the waves crashing on the shore, that one song that gets stuck in your head, and you just can't stop singing it, even though you're pretty sure you've heard it like a thousand times already. There's something kind of comforting about it, isn't there? That sense of familiarity, of predictability. Yeah, I think so. And on that note, I think we've reached the end of this deep dive. Indeed. It's been uh, memorable, to say the least. But hey, that's what the deep dive is all about, right? Yeah. Exploring the fascinating, the thought-provoking, and yes, sometimes even the downright weird. <laughs> we'll be back soon with more. So until then, happy diving.